Hello everyone, we are today here at the Panzer Museum in Munster and here is the director, Ralf Ratz. And we thought we'd talk about the Panzer Division and the whole combined arms weapon approach because what I think is usually very understated in military history is the organizational history, like what everything is involved in combined arms warfare is central to the organization. So in my view, or what I know, one of the earliest Panzer divisions the Germans came up was in about 1935 or something mm -hmm. around. Yeah. And they changed quite a lot. But as we mentioned already before, you <laughs> just told me something I didn't know, that actually the Brits yes. invented the first completely yes. combined arms. Yes, they did. Um, normally the, the story goes like this. The, the British invent the tank. Yeah. And 20 years later, the, the Germans invent the tank division, the Panzer Division, and bring the, the technical system to full fruit. So they um, add everything that it's completely self-sustained. You have artillery of anti-tank guns, you have infantry and everything correct. in there. They make the, the tank workable by giving it all it needs to work and then combine everything. Right. The um, thing is, most people forget that the British did this before, 10 years before. In the end of the 1920s, I think 28 exactly, but don't even know it. Um, the Brits founded something they called the experimental mechanical force. Oh, no, the experimental mechanized force. So they took the tanks and they added everything they need, as you said, reconnaissance, artillery, infantrymen, um, and everything else, and um, somehow at least motorized it. Not everything was mechanized, uh, but everything was motorized. Every yeah, the Panzer Division was also Pan the Panzer Division never was fully motorized either. So mechanized, yeah. Sometimes not even motorized. Sometimes you have even horse parts in Panzer divisions. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, where was that? Um, so the Brits took everything they needed and formed it to one unit, this experimental mechanized force. And they even, and that's the important thing, they even put radios on the on the vehicles. So they had kind of communication. That's very important because yeah. often said the, the Panzer division of the Germans was so successful, and it's true, because they were very uh, good in communicating that the technical means and they had the training for it uh, true but the brits even had that before they had the uh, radio and they were able to um, move this brigade sized, uh, sized um, experimental force on the battlefield as a whole so they did what the germans did in a much bigger scale later but they did it they proved it's kind of proof of concept idea and um, they only discontinued it because the political um, factors around it changed the, um, the British said, um, we decide not to get involved in a major war on the European continent Again. for the next 10 years. And uh, that was official policy. So they stopped the funding for this experiment and everything went into colonial policy where you don't need an experimental yeah. mechanized force or the protection of the island, meaning air force and ships. So um, yeah, they, they had the Panzer Division in their hands. They looked at it. A, Good working principle, away with it. But weren't the, the, the armor division in the beginning of the second war from the British, did they also have everything in there? As because I, I think I came across that usually they were all divisions were too tank heavy or something. Right. Um, there too. And the, the main point is they never made the point uh, that the development to, to really have this division as a self sustained mobile force, you have to develop this thought. The Germans did this from 1935 to 1939. They had the time to really make it, let's say, elastic. They had the same problem. Every Panzer division in every state, every concept was at the beginning too tank heavy because everybody trusted the tank too much. Um, yes, the tanks are the core, but you need to have the subtle balance. So every, every country um, strive to find that balance over the years. So that shows how complicated it is. Um, but nevertheless, to, to even reach that point, at first you have to, to be able to think of the division as an organic whole, to yeah. really use it as an instrument, not just as a clutter of bricks or something like that. So yeah, that's what happened. That, that's an important aspect. For instance, like um, when Manstein, for instance, proposed the Sturmartillerie, the Sturmgeschütz, yeah. he said it should be organic to the infantry division. Because if you have subunits and they fight with each other, they need to train with each other because else they don't know what they can do. Usually a regular infantryman in the German army usually was stated, okay, they, they thought that the tank could do everything. Therefore you had Panzer Grenadiers or before that motorized Schützen, motor, motorized riflemen, motorisierte Schützen. So in the beginning of the war, you have, I think, 
way too much tanks. I think I think 300 tanks mm -hmm. in a in a Panzer division. And what what is learned rather fast, the squishy things, the infantrymen <laughs> die way too fast. Whereas even if a tank gets destroyed, usually the tank crewmen survive. So you often have like a Panzer division which don't have any infantry anymore, and so the combined arms bonus basically is gone. True. So, so what, what changed over the development? The next step they do is actually they, they halve their, their tank numbers in the divisions, which makes sense. Um, it's not like some people sometimes say, um, just to double the number of the division. That's not the point. The point is to make the, the, the division that comes out of this process more efficient. Around 150, 160 tanks is the, for a long time, the optimum number to fulfill the missions the division gets. And that's, by, by and large, the, the most basic um, um, sign for quality you can have in the military, if the mission gets fulfilled. Uh, everybody always asks, what's the best tank? Always the tank that fulfills his mission at the point in time. And that's the same with the Panzer Division. Um, they have the numbers of tanks and get the, so to say, the, the space to breathe more, to, to move more around. If you have the normal frontline part for a division and clutter it full with 300 tanks, the bonus of being able to move freely and to use the German word Stoßkraft, the, the, the power to push through something, you lose it if you're cluttered on a space. So if the, you have to give the tanks room to maneuver, to, to breathe, so to say, and that works pretty well at this stage. Was it also a leadership issue, for instance, that controlling yes. 300 tanks, yes. it's, it's just too much? Yes, um, it's, yeah, you can do it, but you don't get any real benefit out of it. So you have to micromanage them very much by not getting much more out of it. So you can do it, but it's, it's wasted, wasted work and manpower. So, so basically you lose an initiative to a certain degree, which was a strength of the Wehrmacht for the Indeed, most part. Too, yes. yeah. so. Good, and so later on, I think the latest tank divisions, they were actually quite infantry heavy, wasn't the, the Panzer right. Division 45 that they basically got rid even of the Panzer Grand Division and basically they had one general arms division. Indeed, and that's one thing you can see in the Bundeswehr later too, that um, it's really the Panzergrenadier Division and the Panzer Division in the Bundeswehr, which is made by people who were experienced the Second World War, so there's a connection, um, is really just, is it a little more tanks or a little, a little more Panzergrenadier? It's basically the same. And that's just because you found this kind of equilibrium in the combined arms warfare. There's at some point this, this point where you balance everything out and then you can have, let's call it a, a little more heavy, version of the of the general division for more heavy for more heavy work or a more light and more nimble version if you have to cover ground for example but basically you have yeah you could call it just combined arms division for the general purpose combined arms division yeah that would be the word so one one more specific question about the whole panzer division i read recently in Turple that he noted that the the adding of self propelled artillery actually greatly enhanced some capabilities what is what is your view on this? How, ma, how much did self-propelled artillery change the effectiveness of Panzer divisions? If you believe Guderian and um, his scholars, it's one of the main points: being able to pull the artillery behind uh, to have this um, cover of, of artillery, artillery support. Um, it's a good point. I think it's valid. Um, I don't think you could you could overstate it because. Even in the war, and even after the war, if you, if you ask veterans, you have people like Balk, one of the famous German generals, who said, yes, um, self-propelled artillery was interesting and uh, many people liked it. I didn't like it. Okay. I liked horse-drawn cavalry because if you have a self-propelled gun and the motor busts up, the whole thing is gone. Uh -huh. If a horse dies, you just change the horse. Um, and there are more things like tracks in the snow, being air reconnoitered and stuff like that. He had multiple arguments. So it's not that a window weapon. It's not that yeah. everybody's wanting SPGs. They work, they do their stuff. They are very good, especially on the operational level, to cover ground, to cover miles, kilometers, to get from one point to the other. But just that's not a special thing. That's just the, the, the mechanism of mechanization. You put everything on tracks, you go smoother through cross country. Was it particularly helpful against counter battery fire? Couldn't say. Okay, I think I think that was Turple's argument. I have to look this up and then. I mean, I you have, have they have the benefit of being mobile during the fight. You don't fire from the move, but you can switch positions very quickly. Um, but then again, well-drilled 
Horstone Artillery could do this too. So I would have to see the, 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 this quote to, to know how he quantifies it. Yeah, I, I'm not I, sure. I, I think that was the argument from Tavern. I was thinking, yeah, I never thought about this because I, I looked at self propelled artillery and thought, okay, that's neat. But, but then I said, he said, okay, this is very good. So, yeah. Um, anything else we have to add about the Panzer Division? Panzer Division, um, it's huge. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. thing people often forget. Um, the Panzer Division has only around 10 to 12,000 people. Normal Infantry Division, 15,000. Depending on the army, you look at 20,000 sometimes. 17,000, 18,000, yes, yes. yeah. We are talking about, let's say, around about 12 to 15,000. Um, that's huge. They eat a lot. They have many horses. Um, you need fodder for them. Um, you need uh, fuel, oil, ammunition in tons and tons and tons. If you look at the map, it's always, you, you look at, you sit at home in your chair, you have a good book, and you see all the divisions on the Eastern Front. Next time you see this, look up what a division needs in fuel and ammunition and food, and then multiply it and think what is flowing behind the divisions. Because that's one point, the Germans lost, not at last because of the, 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 um, of the logistics they couldn't handle. And we are always thinking, yeah, what is it, some food, some fuel? No, it's, it's millions of tons of everything that you have to produce, pack up, bring to the front, and then distribute into yeah, the war fighting zone. It's, 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 it's crazy. And the Germans basically saw logistics as a third class task. So. Um, yeah, there, there's one thing you have to know. They, they, yeah, they develop this, this wonderful tool, the Panzer Division, with nothing to support it on. It's not sustainable in the long term. I mean, it was sustainable basically in Western Europe with the, with the infrastructure there. Indeed, but, yes. but with the population density and vastness of the Eastern Front, it doesn't work out. And the Soviets, basically, with the rear services, they put the logistics guy as the deputy commander in their mm. organization. But they always had logistical issues. So, and, and there's also the, the basic notion about population density highly affects yeah. how much logistics you need. For instance, in Western Europe, railway wasn't initially not that important because, well, there was enough population density. But in the American Civil War, once they invaded the South, they realized, oh, damn it, we, we, need, we need all the stuff because there's yeah. not enough people there. I mean, one thing is, don't forget, in, in France, 1940, Every German officer knew the map, for example, out of his head because they had every square meter in their training every day. And then they, they got to Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, where there are villages, they can't even say the name. Yeah, well, it's oh, written down. I, I, I lately had the problem finding one, one name of some battle or something on a map and no chance. I think we, we were three guys and searching for 50 yeah. minutes each to finally pin it down it's, it's yeah. like insane and also in france most officers fought there already in the first world but to a certain degree as Many, well no, indeed. so on the eastern front it's always you, you just get lost yeah yeah i think that's it yeah i think we covered that so big thank you here and be sure thank to check you. out oh. the panzer museum on youtube <laughs> do that until next time bye bye, -bye.